Our Irish roots lie in the distant past of Stone Age hunter and Bronze Age farmer. But our deepest conscious sense of continuity stems from that which is Celtic, for there are our language, our customs, our modes of thought, our very Irishness. The spirit which unites us to our past is expressed in many things, in carved stone heads, in religious sanctuaries or royal seats like ancient Tara, in cast bronze figures from Celtic temples in Gaul, in richly carved stones such as that from Turo in County Galway, or in the contemplative serenity of a Celtic face cut from the rock over 2,000 years ago. Here in the time of Celtic beginnings is an Ireland looking back to a prehistoric past, looking forward to the greatness she was to achieve a millennium later. By about the year 500 BC, there was in Ireland an established bronze-using community of considerable wealth based upon the exploitation of metal resources, pastoralism on an extensive scale, and also probably on trade in slaves, hides, and metals. Contacts with the outside world, both commercial and cultural, were close, and though society at home appears to have been conservative, influences from abroad began gradually to have an effect on the country. Thus it was that objects representative of what is called the Hallstatt culture, the earliest period of the continental Iron Age, began to reach Ireland. There were new types of swords, long blades of bronze with fishtail shaped hafting plates carried in scabbards of wood or leather with widely spraying bronze shapes, and containers of sheet metal became common, such as large cauldrons of bronze, and buckets with ring handles. Iron, too, began to be known, but slowly, hesitantly. Socketed axe heads with loop handles, the most popular form at the end of the Bronze Age, were copied in forged iron, and shaft hole axe heads, such as the one on the screen, and pins were also made in this material. But as the excavation of a Cranach at Loch Dara shows, used by a population, the basic culture of which was still Bronze Age in type, at about this time, too, there occurred considerable deterioration in the climate of continental Europe, and this may have been a contributory cause in the general unrest which is evident on the mainland in the centuries immediately before the birth of Christ. This was the time when a community speaking a Celtic language and with a common culture became widespread in Europe. These Celts, as we may indeed call them, first appear certainly in the area between the headwaters of the Rhine and the Danube. And from this region, as the centuries advance, the Celts move to the west and to the east. They occupy the whole of Gaul, as France was then called. They moved into Spain and northern Italy. They even sacked the mighty city of Rome. They established themselves in Bohemia, the western province of Czechoslovakia. They were mighty warriors, and many of them took service in the armies of Greece. Advancing from the north under their leader, Bulgios, they overran that country and crossed the narrow straits to Asia Minor, where they were later to be known to St. Paul as the Galatians. The Celts have left little material trace overground on the continent of Europe, but it cannot be gainsaid that they once had formed one of the most extensive empires ever known in the Old World. Ireland could not remain aloof from the consequences of the existence of such a mighty political, military, and cultural force. Clearly, the Celts must have had forerunners in the areas in which they are known to have been established. But these cannot now, with certainty, be identified. It is, however, true to say that the period of their heyday, of their greatest expansion, coincides with that of the spread of a culture known as Latin, so-called after a site in Switzerland. And it is generally agreed that the Latin culture was specifically that of the continental Celts. Where a full Latin culture is found, it is reasonable to assume that there also Celtic peoples reigned. 